Hi, my name is Sarah Benson, a copyright librarian at the University of Illinois. Today I want to talk to you about copyright term for U.S. published materials between 1923 and 1978. Under today's copyright rules, it's not necessary to put the copyright symbol on your work, nor is it necessary to register your work with the Copyright Office. But under the old rules, copyright was based on formalities. What do we mean by formalities? Are we talking about black tie preferred, like a tuxedo? No, not that type of formality. And why did formalities end after 1989? Well, in 1988, the United States signed the Berne Convention, and that required that all formalities disappear. What are the formalities? One of the formalities was the required use of the copyright symbol. For a work published before 1978, this was important. Under 1909 Copyright Act, the copyright symbol had to be on the title page or the page immediately after. If it wasn't, then the work was not protected under copyright and could fall into the public domain. Under the 1976 Copyright Act, which was in effect from 1978 until March 1st of 1989, the copyright did not have to be on the title page or page immediately after. It just had to, quote, give reasonable notice of copyright protection. But if the work was published without the appropriate notice, it could be cured if the work was registered with the Copyright Office within five years of publication. The next requirement or formality was that you had to register the copyright with the Copyright Office. Under the 1909 Copyright Act, failure to promptly deposit two copies of the work could forfeit your copyright protection. Copyright registration itself was optional during the first term of protection, but failure to register meant that you would forfeit the second term of protection and you were unable to sue for infringement. The first term was 28 years. So if you weren't registered, you would only get the 28 years of protection. If you did register and renew, you could get a total of 95 years of protection. Under the 1976 Copyright Act, registration is voluntary, but it is necessary to sue for infringement. The third copyright formality, which was already alluded to, is the need to formally renew the copyright with the Copyright Office. Under the 1909 Copyright Act and its amendments, if the copyright was registered during the first term, you must renew during the final year of the term of protection, in other words, the 27th year. But a failure to renew meant you forfeited the copyright protection. So, for 1923 to 1963 works, the 28-year term was extended to 95 years if the renewal was timely filed. For 1964 through January 1st of 78 works, there was an automatic renewal by law. What does this all mean? There is a strange era in United States copyright law between 1923 and 1978 where work may be in the public domain for failure to comply with copyright formalities. In summary, if a work was published before 1978 with no copyright notice, it could be in the public domain. If there was a failure to register the work during the first term, then there was no ability to renew and the term would end after just 28 years, between 1923 and 63. If you filed the work with the Copyright Office for registration, but you failed to renew the registration in the 27th year from 1923 to 63, then after the 28th year, the work would fall in the public domain. Or, if you published the work without notice and you failed to register the work within five years from 1978 to March of 1989, the work would be in the public domain. Seriously? Do you expect me to remember all of this? Here's the wonderful news. You don't have to. There are some wonderful cheat sheets out there. One is Peter Hurdle's copyright term public domain chart. Let's take a look at it. You can see here that he has a very handy guide that tells us when we need to look for the public domain work and what different rules apply in the different terms. For instance, works first published in the U.S. before 1923 are in the public domain due to copyright expiration, and so on and so forth. Next, there's something called the Copyright Genie. Let's take a look. You first have to ask, is the work in question copyrightable? Let's assume the answer is yes. Has it been published? Again, that's the kind of work we're talking about. 
Where was it first published? Yes, in the United States. And was it created by an individual? Yes. What about the date of publication? Let's just for fun pick a date between 1923 and 1963. How about 1943? Next, was the work published with a copyright notice? Let's say yes. Was it renewed? Let's say no. Then it says it's in the public domain. So this is a really great tool. And last, let's look at the copyright digital slider. Here it says, set the arrow at the correct date and read the information in the windows. Mouse over any asterisks or notes for clarifying information. Let's say this work is after 1922 but before 1964, published with notice but not renewed after 28 years. Do I need permission? No, because it's in the public domain. So this has a bunch of wonderful information as well. How can I check copyright registration and renewal on my own and verify those genies and things like that? That has been made easier by the Copyright Office and the Stanford Copyright Renewal Database. To check on the original status of copyright, you could go to the Copyright Office, but they only have works from 1978 to present. If you forget, they tell you right here, works registered prior to 1978 are not listed here. So now what? Well, we have to check the catalog of copyright entry records online. This gets a little tricky because you actually have to know the year that the work was registered. Let's say we want to look for a work from 1927. Then you have to go into the right subpart. Let's say it's a book. 1927 part 1 books. Now you can search inside for the book that you're looking for. This would check tell us if the book was originally registered. Then we have to determine if it was renewed in the 27th year after the first registration. We can figure this out by going to the Stanford database. Here you can search for records between 1923 and 63 and you can search by title or author. Let's try an example. Let's say I'm holding a rare copy of a published book by Aldous Huxley titled A Brave New World. Let's say I know that the book was published in 1932. I should immediately check for a copyright notice. I see one inside the book cover. What next? Remember, I don't think I can look this up at the U.S. Copyright Office because this is before 1978. Where do I go from there? Let's go to the catalog of copyright entry records online. This book, remember, was from 1932. Let's look in 1932 and go to books. Let's search for Brave New World. We see Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, Double Day, registered it in 1932. Perfect. So I know that it was registered and had a copyright notice. So it would at least get 28 years of protection. What's my next question? Remember, my next question is, was the copyright renewed in the 27th year? Well, for that I have to go to the Stanford database. Great. Here I'm going to search by title. Brave New World search and I find it. It was published in 1932. The date of renewal was 1959. So I see that it was published and it was renewed. Therefore the copyright term is quite long. It should be 95 years. Let's find out. Let's go to the copyright genie. Yes it's published in the United States by an individual, date of publication 1932, with a copyright notice, and it was renewed. This is currently covered by U.S. copyright law and will enter the public domain on January 1st of 2028. The work was published and renewed, so it has 95 years from the date of publication. I've checked my work and I did it correctly. That's a nice way to figure that out and make sure you're right. If you still find this confusing, you can check out my library guide at www.guides.illinois.edu/copyright-reference-guide. Thanks for watching.